Okay, go ahead, please. All right, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for amazing May to Bernie to Center of the 12 House. It's interesting because um, just a few minutes ago we started talking because we have a bit of time and someone asked me um, my background in astrology and um, it kind of, what was very interesting is it came out as being, um, one of the things that brought me to astrology was Pluto and Chiron transiting my ascendant uh, back in 1999 when I moved here to Santa Fe and nothing in my life really made any sense. Um, so I saw an astrologer here in town named, whose name is Tom Brady, not the football star. <laughs> and he um, explained to me the, um, you know, what it meant about having Pluto and, and Chiron um, going over my ascendant. He said it would be a four year process. It was very interesting because it, it helped me to step into um, what I now kind of understand, and many of you probably understand who are here, um, uh, stepping into a, what I call a liminal space, you know, that space kind of in between worlds, that world that unites the seen and the unseen. And um, when he said that four year period, I kind of stepped into this place of, which kind of was what, something that I've kind of done my whole life, of stepping into trusting um, the unfolding. And so I went up to a place here in Santa Fe called 10,000 Waves and was soaking in one of the Japanese tubs. And I overheard someone talking about a four year psychological program uh, based in the work of Wilhelm Reich, uh, John Paracas and Alexander Lowen. And what I really liked about it is uh, it took the, um, it's funny because I always blank on this word psychology because I think it, that it bothers me so much, the pathologizing of systems, um, pathologizing of cycles and, um, and brought a little bit more of a spiritual understanding to it as well as an opening and connection with that which comes from above, that which is spiritual and our physical form, which then of course helped me to understand esoteric understandings. And as you'll see with um, kind of what unfolded along the path ended up intertwining with astrology in a beautiful way and really helped to define my path as an astrologer um, and helped me to understand the importance of wanting to bring this tool to other people and help them to, uh, to find a greater peace within themselves as well. So this is a place where even the most, where most astrologers fear to go. Ding, 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 ding. I don't know if, for those of you who remember the movie back in Lady the Exorcist, <laughs> um, the 12th house is the place of our disowned or shattered self. We're going to talk about the history and why it is one of the most confusing. It's been called the house of banishment and hidden in these grandma's attic and family lineage, the house of the pregnant pause, our spiritual practice and testing ground, which is all about knowing oneself or know thyself, the anxieties and fears uh, in this house of unseen forces for those of us who are really sensitive. We pick up on things and sometimes those things aren't necessarily what's actually going on. And then um, I actually consider the 12th house to be the house of projection and it gets played out by planet as we're gonna discuss. It's a huge topic. Um, as people wish, um, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, I have this basically laid out pretty easily so I won't lose my place even though we're talking about this very confusing place of the 12th house. Um, so please, you know, as you wish to share. Um, I like what Chris Brennan states about Hellenistic astrology. He calls it uh, the bad house, the bad spirit, which is the Caicos daimon and where Saturn has its joy. I like this picture of the Amity, Amityville horror house. Um, it's, um, people, you know, it's gonna say, stay out, don't go in. <laughs> and I love this from a, um, from a website, bitch, I am the evil, in my, evil spirit in my house. Um, when one, um, there, there's a sensitivity and a softness, a softness that comes with the 12th house, but there's also can be a little bit of a, a, a strength and a power in there. Um, I'm a 12th house Scorpio, so of course this is going to flavor my understanding of the 12th house. The 12th house has a pretty bad reputation in astrology. It is supposed to signify things like self undoing, imprisonment, secrets in general, secret enemies, seclusion, and generally being withdrawn from the world. And it is usually regarded as being one of the worst houses in the chart. But to be fair, it is also said to signify enlightenment, spiritual retreat, and a very high regard for all things mystical and spiritual. And who said that? Mr. Robert Hand. Um, the 12th house is not 
something that is really supported in society. Um, as, as many of you know, um, who have plants in the 12th house or who study these different areas and look, even there aren't very many astrologers who even talk about this area. Um, I think unless we have a very personal experience with it or are um, brought down like Persephone into the underworld um, by Hades or Pluto into, into this deeper understanding, um, it, one doesn't necessarily have to be hanging out in these places. Not This, this isn't where everyone hangs out, <laughs> for those of you who do. <laughs> Some of those things I had to come to, come to understand over time. Um, I believe that through awareness, self-centering, and a neutral, non-reactive approach to life, we grow, and that challenges and adversity produce the fertile fields for new births. Um, as we know in astrology, everything is a cycle, and the 12th house is a very important part of the whole life cycle, of the one of 12 cycle in, in, the, in life. And again, I love this, this painting by uh, Botticelli. Sundar Botticelli, it's the map of hell taken after uh, Dante's Inferno. Um, the, at the opening would be right about here where one would start. You know, this is coming up from the upper worlds where here's the green up here in the upper left. And here's where, um, you know, the entrance would say, you know, in the river sticks, you can see the river here. Um, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Um, there's a surrender that happens with the 12th house. There is... Um, there are powers beyond which one has no control. And yet simultaneously, I believe there is an energy of co-creation, of course, at every time. And so um, it's this, as we talked about a little bit earlier, I believe the 12th house has to do with, um, with the surrendering of the ego. And when we think of the 12th house, the last sign uh, moving over, you know, it's in Pisces. There, there's an element to it of death. There's an element to it of passing over. There's an element of letting go of form, letting go of structures, letting go of that to which we have been held onto before and become back um, with oneness. And that is not something the ego is very comfortable with. Um, for those of you who are familiar with The Course in Miracles, uh, one of the great lines is, um, you know, are you the drop of water on the ocean or are you a drop of water of the ocean? Or something along those lines, you know, it's that idea that, you know, that separateness that we believe we have this inherent belief that we're this, this separate um, individualized uh, being, like a drop of water that's in the ocean. And yet they're, you know, how does one differentiate that? And that's, and that's what the 12th house is, is really about. Chaos <laughs> and harmony. You know, it's finding that place. It's, it's the, um, it's that axis, right? The, the polarity is, is that structured Virgo that wants everything to be in place, everything to be done right, all the T's to be crossed, all the I's to be dotted, um, nothing to be left to chance, um, everything in order. And uh, that isn't what goes on in this place. Um, order is not what the universe is about. There's a harmony that exists in the universe, but the order, um, yeah, I would say that chaos, chaos reigns until, until, harmony, until harmony remains, one of the ancient sayings that <laughs> I think Alan Oaken used to say all the time, but I believe it. <laughs> so what do we have in the attic? We have fate. Um, fate's a very interesting thing. Here in the West, we don't really like to believe in fate very much. Um, our Eastern sisters and brothers, especially of the Vedic tradition, understand what fate is and the limitations and strengths and all the different aspects to it. In fact, um, the Vedic system is, is so amazingly structured in that way to be able to, to, to play all that out. But um, what we in the West fail to remember is that fate happens for us in our biology, um, in our family lineage. Those are things, that, uh, again, over which we have no control. Um, the way our blood comes through, the way um, diseases may be present in our system, the things we may be passing on to our children, biological fate, biological determination. Um, you know, so it's that which we gain from our family. It's, it's that which um, that comes down, um, you know, within the clan in a sense, which is very Cancerian, but in, in a larger sense, you know, in that, you know, whatever those predispositions are meant to be in your, in your beingness, you know, who you're here to become. Um, those of you who have studied uh, 
medical astrology can see how the chart also shows the various um, systems of health and what type of health an individual is going to have and the type of issues they're going to have throughout their lifetime. Um, and, and the 12th house shows, um, you know, some of this blood, blood history. And the question I like to ask with people is, you know, is it your matrilineal line or your patrilineal line or both? You know, is it coming from your mother's side or your father's side? I have a Scorpio 12th house. Um, I have my moon there. I have Neptune there. Um, I had a grandmother who was my unconditional love, um, was my saving grace. And so for me, I really see my 12th house as being my, my matrilineal line. But I think that's with, you know, with each individual. I find... Um, um, oftentimes people who have strong 12th house positions, especially with Neptune or the moon, that there was a, a, a really strong grandmother presence. Um, and I think in a way they act as um, beautiful angels for those of us. Um, there's a, when we, when we raise children, you know, when you think about when most people are the age of, of having children and raising them, you know, when we're in our twenties and early thirties, we're very full of ourselves. We're very busy doing a lot of things. We don't really necessarily have the time and energy to devote to um, children the way sometimes they need. And so, you know, when children get to spend time with grandparents, that, that unconditional love a grandparent can give that who isn't tied up in every little thing that you do or don't do and, and understands that, you know, that, <laughs> that you're going to mess up. Let's, let's face it. I mean, that's one thing that parenting teaches you is learning how to let go of those, um, a lot of those things that, whether it being perfect in that way. Hello. Michael, I have a question for you. Sure, Wendy. So, um, can you speak to why it's considered biological inheritance? I guess in my mind, the word biology makes me think of Pluto and it makes me think of Scorpio, which is not necessarily the 12th house. I mean, I know the fourth and eighth and 12th all have ancestral connection. Um, it was interesting. I just recently gave this talk for a group in England and I got a, an email from one of the people who was in the talk and she said that actually um, two of her daughters, and it's funny that you say that with Pluto being the marker, but they both had um, Pluto in the 12th house and they both inherited the, um, the a gene that the mother carried. So um, I, I don't know why. <laughs> It's just, you know how these things, you know, when we do these research and we start focusing on these certain areas in astrology, um, things speak to us. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've talked to anyone who's written a book, like I've talked to Melanie Reinhardt when she started writing Chiron. She said just like literally everyone started coming out of the woodwork sharing their Chironic stories with her. But that's just something that I've seen with it. And yeah, I mean, I think Pluto's going to show, you know, a little more, you know, maybe that's going to be more of a, a tainted issue. Um, but I just see there's something that comes through. I mean, it's a water house. Um, and it's just, for whatever reason, I see it come through. Okay, uh, thank you. I just thing, had never heard that before. One thing I would say, you know, esoterically, the esoteric ruler of Pisces is Pluto. So maybe that's a link that I'm making that maybe a lot of other astrologers oh. maybe don't link, find in that sense, but it's just, you know, something I'm that, seeing. That makes sense to me, yeah. You know, feel free to go and, you know, check it out and see, you know, see how that plays out and... But I just, oh, yeah. I just find, I think it's, it's one of these areas too, where we, um, where we're facing something over which we have no control. Right. Something, something showing up over it um, that, you know, that, that planet is showing some sort of a biologic or some sort of a familial history that's going on that, that is, gonna, is definitely going to show up. Family secrets, of course. Um, yeah. I mean, up until, you know, recently, I mean, family secrets were pretty common. I mean, most people didn't know that their mother was actually their aunt or their grandmother or their, the, the woman who they thought was their aunt is actually their mother. You know, I, I've heard so many bizarre stories over the years of, of individuals being raised um, in an environment where they're not being told the truth. And I think that creates also a whole other level of, of damage to to the child but it's also one of those things i think we're here to work out you know to find out you know i think that it helps us to become um kind of a sleuth <laughs> you know kind of asking learning to either ask the questions and finding out what the truth is about things or or letting them be and i think that just depends on each person because we're realizing we have to work with the individual and familial unconscious. That's one of the aspects is, that we're working here. So not everyone, Wendy, as you know, like for working with the core work, not everyone wants to do core energetic works. Not everyone wants to bring the, um, their, not everyone wants to bring the 
developmental trauma they've had and address it in such a way that they can really deal with it because it, it, it kind of takes a little bit of courage. It takes a, a bit of determination and strength to do that. It's not that, um, that not everyone's not able to do it, but it's, it's not an easy path to face these things. That's um, for Michael? sure. Oh, yes. Michael? Yes, ma'am. Can I uh, ask a question? Please. Uh, Wendy, were you, were you finished or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, this is amazing because it's bringing up a lot for me. Um, I've got Jupiter in the 12th. And so Pluto is the esoteric ruler of the 12th. Could we say that Pluto, in a sense, is destroying what is there? And so for, in my case, with Jupiter, when I go to share knowledge or to say, you know, I know something or to share what I know, brings up a really deep sense of guilt. Could this be like the Pluto 12th kind of destroying what's there because it is dissolving the ego? Yes, and I think that's very interesting. We're going to get into it a little bit with it, but I love what you're touching on because I think it, it's not, it's, so I mean, look what you're doing. You're providing this, you know, you're sitting on here, you're, you've got a stock photo on there and you're presenting this great platform for, for all this knowledge to come forward. Yes. And then the question that I would ask at some point is then when or when is it time for Linda to be stepping in onto that stage and then presenting all that knowledge? <laughs> it's not right now, that's for sure. <laughs> and that's okay because to be honest, I think that's that's really an important part of it. You know, like how they talk about in the sixth house, you know, if you had if you had a Jupiter in the sixth house, one would say, Oh, you have a lot of mentees, meaning you're gonna mentor a lot of people. But you know, your 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 doing it for teachers. <laughs> yes, yes. And I feel that I feel that the, this 12th house is is also the pro, a projection thing. So it's a lot easier to see because I think there's one of these things like there's there's an egoic there's an egoic checks or check or balance or something that happens in this house that it's like don't get too big for yourself. So I mean what I hear in that is like there's there's this energetic self-corrective energy that kind of comes and says, hey, you know what? You there's something in this that you need to learn. This, you but are what's, exactly spot on. <laughs> and what's wonderful is through what you're doing here, because I mean, this is what I was doing for Alan Oaken. This is what I was doing for other people as well. And then eventually you step into this place where it's like, oh, I can see all the ways that these people are sharing their knowledge and I need to share my knowledge. And this is the way I'm going to share my knowledge. And, and you're, you're probably looking at it going like, oh, I don't think I'd want to do it that way. And oh, I don't want to do it this way. And you're finding the ways of fine tuning it Plus, you're just building, I mean, oh my God, you're, you're immersed in it every time you do this. So you're just being blessed, 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 blessed. Yes, I think you're spot on. And um, the fine tuning, yes, definitely. Um, oh, it's fascinating. I, I love this meeting. So yes, carry on. I'm finished for now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful, Linda. I have the Jupiter in the 12th too and some other stuff going on in there. So that's very interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Well, <laughs> I love it. It's like there's no, there are no mistakes. <laughs> All righty. So, you know, imprisonment and seclusion, um, you know, it depends on how we play it. Um, I, and I'm really bad at names and I, and I really, and it's one of those people who I should really know. And I'm, and I'm probably going to ruin his name. Paramahamsa Yo, Paramahamsa Yo, I know the guy, <laughs> there was a wonderful yogi who actually was imprisoned and he attained enlightenment in prison. So um, that to me is an example of a 12th house experience. It's where um, it's, it's, we're forced, we're forced to face ourselves. And um, I have to say when, when I started reading about the 12th house stuff, I was really very, um, and, and Wendy and, and Linda, I don't know if you felt the same, but um, I, I was immediately bothered by the um, imprisonment things. And right away, like for me, like, yeah, monastery, you know, put me up in the cloister somewhere, you know, somewhere, you know, some kind of seclusion. But that imprisonment thing is like one of those energetic, um, I'm, I think I'm probably still working on that one. My, my Mars actually sextiles my Virgo up at the top of my chart and, and um, my Mars and Virgo at the top of my chart at Midheaven. So it's just, it's, you know, it can get really fiery. So I, you know, this idea of when people get um, imprisoned for the wrong reasons is, um, is very um, viscerally painful to me. Um, and that's part of, you know, our compassion aspect. Those of us who have this 12th house, there's this a very subtle, subtle, subtle um, sensitivity that we have. 
um, they're the parts of ourselves that are unowned. Because we walk um, kind of about straddling this in-between world, people don't really know how to handle us very well. And so, um, like I've talked about Pluto aspects before, you know, people are really strong Plutonians, people who are strong Neptunians. Um, people give us wide berth because we have this energy that we're putting out. But we're also the first ones they go to when, when they're in trouble and they need some guidance because they help us, we help them see things. Um, it's, it's the shadow, it's the unnamed shadow we, that we don't really want to take care of ourselves. And um, as Wendy knows very well, in, in, in Corona Jugs, we talk about um, the shame of the higher self. Um, many of us here who you know, are working in astrology and working in, in new age movements, you know, there's this whole self, you know, aggrandized higher self aspect that, that almost always gets, you know, is almost always presented. And, um, but what people don't understand is that there's another aspect or there's a little bit of a flip side where we have, you know, shame about that. I mean, Linda, you said it really beautifully about, you know, sharing your knowledge. I mean, that's, that, that is a, um, a shame of the higher self because you do have that wisdom. But also, um, I would say that it, to, to give yourself the compassion and understanding that, that you are allowing for it to take the time it needs. It, it's, it's gestating. I think, you know, things... Uh, planets in the 12th house take however long they take to get to where they need to. There's not really any pushing them. Um, and again, maybe that's my scorpionic side saying that, but but it, there's just, um, hmm, you know, how does one fight against fog? How does one fight against um, primal energy? I mean, the uh, our human our human selves don't have, we're not wired that way. So we have to, we have to let go. We have to surrender to it. And again, like I said, the projected self, I, I every time I see a planet in the 12th house, I see someone who is um, not, you know, how are they not owning that planet? How, how are they not owning the, the strength and power of that of that 12th house? How are they letting other people be big? I mean, Linda, this is a, a perfect example. Wendy, I don't know you well enough, but Linda, since you know you have Jupiter in the 12th, I mean, you're, you're creating a space for people to present themselves in a really wonderful big way. It's very generous. It's very thoughtful. It's, it's very grand and beautiful. And, you know, eventually what would be great is, is, you know, you're, I would say maybe you're practicing to give yourself that as well. Maybe that's a nice way to say that. And of course, it's transcendent. I mean, how can how can it not be transcendent? <laughs> but also not accepting that, you know, it's the place then, of course, of drugs and um, you know, and delusion, where we where we um, where we can mistake our transcendence, where we can get lost in the in the journey, so to speak. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And of course, monastery and convent, um, which you know, again, each of these has their positive and negative sides. There's there's ways in which it, it's really beneficial. I mean, if you are a person who has um, a spiritual nature that is devoted to um, to spirit and is not really physically oriented than being in, in a place where your meals are provided for you and, and you have a room that you can go to and you don't have to deal with all the issues that go on in the physical world, that can be a really important part to you. I also think sometimes it's past life bleed through for many of us who have just had so many lifetimes in that and our lives are so hectic now. I mean, I actually remember being even in my teens and going, oh my gosh, it'd be, what a, I'd see pictures of, of monasteries or visit them on travels. And I'm just like, oh my God, I, could, I just want to stay here. <laughs> it's like home. And of course, it's the place of the mystic or the sensitive and, and how that can also not be let out. The French have a perfect word for it, le néant, the nothingness. Um, existential, French existentialism is based on le néant, the nothingness. But it's, to be honest, um, I think it's more when, like, when physicists talk about black matter or when scientists talk about black matter in the universe, there's more black matter in the universe than there is that which is that we're seeing. Um, and, and that is le néant. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's also an inherent knowingness in this place. Um, this isn't... This isn't a nothingness that is a that is black unconsciousness. This is a nothingness that is filled with um, with consciousness. And of course, spirituality. Oh my God, more bars. Religions go here. You know, I mean, um, religions can can prevent people from getting to where they need to be, but they also provide people with the safety and the guidance and the structures they need to help kind of learn um, important rules in life. Um, I've been kind of playing with this idea of archetypes 
lately and how you know each age has its archetypes and um there's a good there's a really lovely show on um not lovely i don't know why i'm calling it lovely but a fascinating show called gods in america or america american gods on um on prime and i really highly recommend it because it's, it's this play on the old world gods odin being one of the main ones um and the new ones coming in like technology you know the god of technology and it's where we put our energy it's where we put our focus um and the 12th house is one of those really subtle things we can you know for those of us raised in certain religions we can kind of have kind of like it's, it's a little, can be a little bit of our hardwiring it can be kind of something that we kind of understand in a really easy way but it also might have been something that helped limit us in ways um from pre preventing us from seeing our greater selves or our higher selves and especially i think when it comes to women because i, I think most of the world religions don't um, to support women as in, in the ways they should gurus fall in this place um i think guru one of the most important part about gurus you know we're obviously shifting out of that time energy it's more about people becoming their own gurus but that's part of the process right we you know people who follow gurus um do it in order to after because it's about giving power away right you're giving your power to the guru you you're telling them oh you know i'm giving my chance and you're giving all your power away until you realize hey you know the truth is this is my power this is my energy i am my own guru i know myself best but that is not something that one can say early on the path and so you know many of us have to go through different experiences with different people to kind of learn you know teachers of course fall into this category too and it's interesting i don't know if you know this but in um in um Sanskrit guru, um, Jupiter is guru. So here we were talking about you two with Jupiter in the 12th house. So it's perfect. You guys are both, you guys are both spiritual gurus. And I, and I actually would really, really invite you to kind of step into that energy more and more because um, it is really powerful. Not, not from that egoic standpoint, but from that, you know, Jupiter is, you know, from the esoteric teachings is the second ray too. It's love. So it's that unconditional love wisdom and sharing that. And from the 12th house, that's oh, exquisite cults of course i mean <laughs> how do you tell the difference between some cults and, and certain gurus i mean you know gurus start cults i'm gonna take a drink of water so on the chart itself you know what are we talking about we're talking about this 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 area right over here it's 33 to 360 degrees in the in the regular chart you know if we're looking in here on the eightfold chart this is from turn this away this is from uh, Maria K. Sims, um, and thank you for that. Um, shows just just to show you kind of like that, and and you know, so the focus is going to be really on that balsamic phase. It's really about letting go. Um, you know, uh, when we're on our deathbed, it's not the time when we can make a mad grab for power. When we're um, when we're in the process of letting go of something, um, it's not the time to initiate. So um, this is a very internal space. It's, it, it's the place where we need to learn to take better care of ourselves. And we say, this is an end of a cycle, but you know, as, as we know, and each ending is also a beginning and it's really important to allow things to, to be fallow, to, to rest, to let, you know, this is a time where you would just let the, the, um, the field be still. Um, you've already plowed in the remains or the burned, um, the, what you've burned from the previous growth cycle and you've um, tilled them into the ground and the seeds are in there and seeds have, seeds have them, the seeds are in the process of getting put in there, but it's, it's basically that stillness. It's, it's, it's that, um, it's that, um, that pre-dawn moment, um, actually, when you think about it, because, you know, it's that part of the chart as well. I personally am a whole sign person. So um, I, but that doesn't mean that the ascendant doesn't start, isn't a sensitive point. I still use all of the angles in the chart. I find them to be very crucial. In fact, I did a book on um, the angles called um, Astrological Mavericks. You have what it takes to change the world because I found such a strength with this. And, and it leads into this because it, it, it starts with this 12th house placement. Um, I began um, uh, meeting people who, have 
12th house planets conjunct their ascendant. And what I find, and I don't know if, for those of you if, you, if you've kind of paid attention to this, but the closer it is to the ascendant, I find it, the more it plays into the actual birth of the individual. So I've seen people who have, um, say, Neptune just above their ascendant. Well, um, there was a snowstorm or heavy rainstorm on the way to the hospital or the mother's water broke really early. Tom Brady was the first one who put my mind on it because he was born with, um, with Saturn on his ascendant right after his ascendant. And immediately after he was born, he was put in an incubator. And so he was separated from his mother. He was um, not, you know, that, 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 creates, um, that creates something, of course. So, you know, the, these, everything we see, you know, this, this chart is a map. These, these charts we see of people, and, and, and Wendy, I don't know if you've known, but I mean, we can, we can look at it and we can see people's, um, you know, what type of, um, what do you, how do you want to say it? Um, where the psychological developmental issues are going to happen, where where people where um, there are going to be you know sort of attacks to the to the individual you know throughout the, through the map of one's life. That's one of the beautiful gifts with astrology. But back to this point, this topic. So, you know, so here we are in the ascendant, which you know when we're born, the ascendant. This is in theory. Of course, this changes by degree. But um, in theory, the idea is that if you if one was to look at the eastern horizon when the child is born, one would see this the sign rising. Um, but it's this interesting movement away the 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 sign the planets are moving versus the way the uh, the zodiac is moving that creates a sort of excuse me liminal you know into the darkness into the light. So that it's, it's this place where you know where where we take our first breath. Um, so how I kind of look at it, or I kind of given a little bit of a wide range with this is um, while I would see someone with Aries, say someone has a 15 degree Aries, um, their ascendant right here, I kind of give the space right from the ascendant all the way to the sign, the full sign above. So I kind of give wherever that is, I, I, I give a bit of a wide berth because I just find that that it's it's such a liminal space and people kind of handle it a little bit differently. and so. You know, feel free to, to check in with it a little bit, but um, I find with the Placidus and Coke and some of the other ones that it, it sometimes can create these really large, especially if someone's born north or south, you can create these really huge first 12th, 6th, 7th houses. And when you think about it, it actually really makes sense because in those communities, that's you, it, community is really important in, <laughs> in those northern and southern climes. But um, yeah, so this is kind of just the realm of, of what we're talking about on the, when we talk about the 12th house itself. And I like this, this is from Nick Anthony uh, Fiorenza, um, a breakdown of, of, of kind of like what we're thinking of, you know, when we look at from kind of a little bit of a psychological standpoint. So if we, of course, know here on the left-hand side of the chart is a very personal side. Um, that quadrant is the extroverted self quadrant and it's moving into the introverted self quadrant. And so what I mean about it, it's this interesting thing, you know, it's when we take, our ascendant is, is that moment we take breath from our mother, when we take, we become our separate being from mom. And so all that came before that is um, we're, we're connected, right? We're by the umbilical cord or we're inside their womb. Um, and so there's that very Piscean sort of a, um, of a connection that doesn't, that doesn't connect. And so it's really interesting too, because then when you think about it, that 12th house falls into the extroverted self, but it's, it's really not. It's this very, um, it, it's this place I think that is, can be extroverted after the introverted self has built in, built the framework and materials it needs in order to operate in its best and highest way. Something that kind of came to me recently as well. And I was looking at the distribution of earth, fire, air, and water. And what I realized is, is here on the left-hand side is the bottom, um, bottom hemisphere in theory and the top hemisphere on the right-hand side. And I was looking by the, um, the number of instances, because there's really not many of them. Of course, we only have, um, we only have three of each of the elements. But to, it was interesting to note that um, fire and earth are, uh, there's more of a predominance of them below the horizon. And it makes kind of sense. You know, it's our, um, our, it's our instinctual nature. It's our um, kind of our, um, you know, both our instinctual, um, I, in a sense, fiery way, but also our instinctual way as far as Mother Earth. 
And then when we move into the place of being able to relate to other, which is what happens after we get over, you know, over in the descendant side, we move up into the upper part of the, uh, the, uh, the um, upper horizon of the chart, then the, um, there's a preponderance of the air and water because that's what we need in order to relate with one another, right? Air in order to speak and talk and water in order to share the emotions and share the, share the feelings with others. Just something, one of my roomings, rum, ruminations lately. And if there's, if there's one classic um, image that you can walk away with today in regards to planets in the 12th house, I would say to think of the Wizard of Oz. And so I love this sign, you know, this thing, you know, and, you know, the wizard is, you know, he's sitting there behind his little curtain and he, and he's, he's got that big machine that's puffing him up and making him big and huge and scary and frightening. And, and he says, and pay no attention to the little man behind the curtain. <laughs> and in a way it's also, you know, it's kind of, it's this dual thing. You see a little bit, it's that 12th house placement. It's also, it's a little bit of that ego thing, you know, don't pay attention to that ego, you know, don't pay attention to that thing that's trying to run the show. And a Freudian slip was when you say one thing but mean another. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is the realm of the twelfth house. It's it's a place of I, I believe of of great faith and um, and belief and um, and uh, and letting go. And one of my favorite sayings is "Go within or go without." Um, there, it. it uh, there's a trust. It's like you know, stepping out. We see a lot. Of, in a lot of movies and you know when people are you know, when the hero is going on after something you know there's a scene maybe where they have to walk across a chasm and their belief has to be strong enough for them to know that there is a pathway there and they just have to believe it and hold it that's kind of what the 12th house is about it's kind of like just literally sometimes putting one foot in front of the other just slowly going because it's this thing of like okay is this right for me? Is this true? And then taking another step, is this right for me? Is this true? You know, being connected. One of the things the 12th house really does is it helps build our inner connection with ourselves so we can understand when we need to say no. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to build that ability. One of my favorite places on the planet, one of my heart centers, Chart Cathedral. Found it interesting to find to run across it that each of the layers represents each of the astrological rings. So it's interesting, you know, you've got Aries there at the heart, very, at, the, at that middle, and then Pisces is, you know, again that all-encompassing. Um, um, the idea that we have to go through things, the idea that we have to um, sometimes endure things that aren't that easy. Um, Dolly Parton has a line. She says, um, "You can't have rainbows without rain." <laughs> and I think that's a really wonderful 12th house uh, statement. All righty. So when I talk about spirituality, I'm saying relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to the material or physical things, as in I'm responsible for his or her spiritual welfare. Relating to religion or religious beliefs, um, I, I see religious as being following others' beliefs, learning the structures and things, and the spirituality is when you become your own, you know, you begin to set, you know, follow the beat of your own drum, so to speak. And then, um, and spirituality is the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or opposed, or opposed to material or physical things. Um, it's, it's that which lies around all within. Again, it's kind of like what I talked about with, with the black matter. There's a consciousness to it. For those of you who have seen the movie, What Dreams May Come, um, I think it's a fantastic movie uh, about what happens after we let go um, of our physical form. This is one of the scenes about the Akashic Records room. Um, people with 12th house planets have an ability to access information that other people don't really understand where they gather it. Um, I, I think 12th house planet people have um, the ability to um, kind of sink in. I mean, nowadays we have, you know, with computers the way they are, we have this understanding and also the movie Avatar kind of showed it where they, you know, they have this thing where you kind of do it and then it kind of just links up, you know, with the creatures. We have it with our, all of our cords and things around here. Um, but you know, the 12th house people have kind of like an energetic sense of it. It's like that great tree. It's, it's sending out the tap roots and making that level of connection all throughout. Another image that I thought was just really well, I mean, uh, through meditation, it's, it's a great way to access that. But, um, 
some people can just access it in the moment. I, I tend to access things in the moment. Um, it, it just, uh, there's really not, again, it's not really about controlling it. It's about learning how it works and uh, modifying your behavior to um, enhance uh, the relationship. So I talked a little bit about before is like journeys. Um, one of the journeys, this is an ayahuasca cloth. Ayahuasca is a, um, I started doing ayahuasca back in the, um, in the late eighties and early nineties. Um, before people were kind of talking about it, it's, it's kind of gotten a little bit out of hand, but um, it literally was like 12 months or six months worth of therapy in an evening um, of facing um, parts of myself that needed to be integrated um, with the appropriate guide, uh, with the, the appropriate instructors, uh, these medicines can be really helpful. Peyote, long tradition of that. Um, um, when I was down in Peru, um, the, the ayahuasca arrows, they do, some of them are doing, you know, two or three journeys a night, um, and, and they're doing it every day. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, for those of us who have to be working on the earth plane, it's, um, I think it can wear, wear things, but, um, but it also opens us up to greater and greater sensitivities. And um, I think that's the challenge of working in our world today. And, and one of the gifts with this, this year, in a way, I think is, because it is such a 20, um, 2020 is such a 12th house year, in fact, and I'm going to talk about that second. But, you know, being forced into being by yourself, being forced into seeing these parts for ourselves is something that um, sometimes the medicines can help us do a little bit easier, but people are kind of being forced to do it on their own. <laughs> I love this image and um, part symptom is uh, tripping on acid. Um, and of course, you know, beautiful parts of stages of death and rebirth. Um, people who have 12th house planets, I find, um, are, we're usually present for the transitions of major cycles, um, helping people pass, help, helping people be born, um, doulas, um, hospice workers, nurses, um, coaches, astrologers. I mean, we're here to help people transform. We're here to help people shed off that old skin that no longer works. Great Piscean principle right there. Jesus Christ is love, the Buddha. One of my favorites, Kuan Yin. Um, she is, um, her gift to all of humanity is remaining until the last soul passes over. Um, that's, that's her gift to humanity. It's great, great compassion, great mercy. Very 12th house. Meditation is very important, dreams. Dream journals, really crucial. Artwork, um, whatever it is that brings up these things. Dreams, they work if you do. <laughs> um, of course, that is one of the aspects of the 12th house. I mean, you can be a really dreamy idealist, but if you're not doing the things that are gonna, taking the steps that are necessary to make those things happen, that dream is never gonna become realized. I see this place as being very chthonic. It's this early, early, you know, this, um, this root energy. You know, this is the land of Neptune. This is the land of water. Um, I call it the rich soil of divine imaginal relationships. Things can be connected here that aren't normally connectable. This is a place where one can make associations that, um, that have an energetic understanding that are, that are more subtle, that may be more challenging to maybe place into words, like here I am trying to place it into words. <laughs> And here, I mean, Wendy, I don't know about you for you, but I mean, I did my core training and everything. And then I learned about Tracy Marks when, when someone read my chart and saw that I had 12 house planets. And, and uh, I started reading Tracy Marks. And I love one of her things in there she said was um, for, you know, especially if you have like a 12th house Scorpio, that you should do something like core energetics or bioenergetics because the shell is so strong and needs to be cracked open. <laughs> And my shell really needed to be cracked up. And let me tell you. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, so um, her books are really great. This Your Secret Self, Illuminating the Mysteries of the Twelfth House. Um, the one on the right is a, is a small little book that she's got. I'm going over here in the bookcase. Um, just beautiful work she did. She's the Twelfth House soul herself. Um, so she, she speaks from the heart. She's, she speaks from, um, speaks from experience. 
this place is really one of the most important things to, I mean, there are a lot of important things to understand with this place, but um, one is differentiating between your feelings and others. Um, it's really easy. I mean, when you think about the Piscean archetype, um, you know, if those of us who had very domineering family members, um, they can control us. They can make us see things and make us believe things that maybe aren't there. And, you know, that's, it's, it's hard because it's very painful and um, causes a lot of damage, but it's also, I think, part of the growth of what we're here to understand and to see that and, and do it. Um, one of my favorite things in core energetics, and I, I use it with so many people, is the one thing you can do is, you know, put your right hand on your heart and your left hand out or either way, it depends on how you want to do your energy. <laughs> and, um, and you do my me, my energy, and you, and you rub your chest, and you do you, outer energy. And that, that just sometimes is really important. And if you're in a position where you can't really do that physically, do it in your mind, because it really helps create a little bit of space, a little bit of distance, a little bit of um, an ability to be able to, to make the appropriate decisions. Because um, 12th house people are really generous with their energy. They give a lot. I mean, you know, um, our host here, um, hostess, um, whose host, I don't know what their proper word is anymore. The person who's doing such a great job of giving us this platform, Linda Johnson, you know, with the Jupiter there, I mean, this is such a, a, you know, that such a great generosity. This is a free platform and she's giving every time and energy and, and corralling. I mean, if anyone's ever tried to work with astrologers, it's like, you know, corralling a bunch of kittens. It's a very interesting, uh, endeavor. <laughs> so bless you. And thank you, Linda. <laughs> I, of course, um, I've never seen anyone with 12th house planets who aren't spiritually inclined. Um, they um, are usually quite in, you know, interested and they're adept at it. Um, I've also seen things um, like, say, with a 12th house Chiron, where um, there is an affliction with God on a certain level, an affliction with this part of themselves. Um, I've seen... Um, you know, a friend of mine who um, had that and um, it was interesting to talk to him about it because it ended up being that he was abused by a, um, by someone in the church, but it wasn't a priest. So um, we can see how that can do it. And, and fortunately for him, it, it affected his, his belief in his faith in God for a while, but it was also then helped him to strengthen and realize that, you know, that was, you know, that individual's issues and for him to come to terms with it for himself. But um, it, it's a very, it's a very rich space. This isn't, this isn't a place for sissies. <laughs> These are, you know, Elaine Aaron's books on the, the sensitive person and the highly sensitive person in love. Um, I really highly recommend reading. Um, it helps to understand um, the ways, you know, the important things about how to relate with other people because the sensitivities are so strong on so many levels. I, I actually call it like the princess and pea, princess and the pea. Um, there's something, and for me, there's one of the things, and I think it's because with the Scorpio Titan, with my Mars and my Moon and my Neptunes there, I have this really weird ability to root out things. I feel like I'm a little truffle pig or something when it comes to people's stuff. And um Sometimes I can find myself, it's interesting, Carolyn, because you said it the other day about a joke that I posted on Facebook, you know, so I can get away with saying things to people in a certain way, but it's sometimes there's something like I can actually, it's almost like I'll wake up. I, I, you know, I think of myself as a fairly conscious person, but I'll actually literally in the moment, like wake up in a conversation. I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but it's like all of a sudden I'll like go, oh my God, why did I just say, what am I doing? But it's like, there's something in me, you know, that scorpionic tendency is so driven for rooting out that thing that needs to be rooted out that I've just, I've, I've learned to not apologize for it. I mean, it sometimes isn't nice. I mean, it's not, as you know, Caroline, it isn't coming from like a mean place. I've had to work really hard on that part of myself because that Scorpio side can be, and I can still actually throw really good jolts with it, but I really want to come from that compassionate side on it and opening that up for people. So that's where I think that kind of comes up. So there's a sensitivity. There's something that knows that when something isn't right. Um, um, yeah. We talked about this already, working with hospice, uh, medical, great place. Um, uh, Mars in the 12th house is, I, I think, a great place for a surgeon. Um, it can be someone who can really know, you know, almost have their eyes closed in a sense and be able to follow that energy and know exactly where they need to cut that where that scalpel needs to go. There's this, there's this interesting 
illogical precision. That would be a way that I would use that energy. And um, so, yeah, I talked a little bit earlier on, and I've kind of peppered a little bit, um, thanks to Wendy being here and, and the question that Nicholson asked me early on about what brought me into astrology. Um, finding the appropriate therapy, I think, is really important. Um, because we're not usual people, we're not going to be good with usual therapists. Um, we need a therapist who actually has um, spiritual depth greater than ourselves. We need to have someone who has the ability to hold us and isn't going to shame us and blame us. Um, because of the sensitivity, I mean, my man's in the 12th house. I, I was born in 65. Um, I, um, I don't think... I don't think the 60s was an easy time for a mother to raise, to, for parents to have a son who had a Scorpio moon. I mean, I, I don't think my family especially wasn't, it still isn't actually capable of being able to handle it or deal with it. So, I mean, these, you know, so it's about finding people who can help work with you in a way that can reflect back to you what your gifts are, what your strengths are. And, and, and do that in a healthy way that isn't uh, making you stay shut down. Because I think that's where, um, when people have 12th house afflicted planets and they aren't getting the help they need, then I think this, that's where the drug, drug abuse goes on, sex abuse, um, the checking out, um, whatever it is that, that disengages us from life. And I like to say the 12th house is where we are all one, same, but not the same. I'm talking about like the drop of water within the ocean. And as I've been talking through to um, through our projections, through seeing, being around these people saying, you know, like, hey, you know, you know, if you have a Jupiter in the 12th house telling people, you know, hey, you're really great, you're powerful, you're wonderful. But then like slowly being able to see, you know, that, that the reason why we're seeing that in that other person is because we have that in ourselves. We wouldn't be able to see those parts in other people if we didn't have a little bit of that element going on in ourselves. So, you know, begin to to own those parts and not and and maybe not. Um, let's see what's the right way to say this. Um, not yeah, not giving it away to the other person completely, but maybe just allowing someone to be like you know, and and I and I can share that wisdom with them or something. Allowing yourself to be a part of that. And, and then it helps to bring a little bit more of an understanding because you're here to do something really fantastic. Um, and yeah, I believe we're all here to own our 12th house planets as we're here to own every planet in our, in our chart. It's one of my favorites, although I saw the pie redone recently on Facebook with even more cut out than this. But um, so if we look at life, this great big circle, what we know, we know is about 25%. We know we know how to drive a car. We know we know how to make breakfast. We know we know how to watch television. Um, the next 25% is what we know we don't know. Um, we know we don't know how to um, be a brain surgeon or be an astronaut or you know whatever those things we know we don't know. And then the vast majority of life is what we don't know we don't know. And this is really, um, this is the realm of the 12th house, of course. Um, it's that, you know, um, I have a third quarter moon, so it kind of helps me understand it. Um, I, I call it the Russian doll syndrome, you know, crisis in consciousness. Um, it's this idea that just when you get to that limit, you know, there's a pinchness that happens. When you think about like a Russian doll, you know, the idea is that it's just gotten so big and then it just, and then it gets the next one, the next one pops. So it's like, you know, how do you, it's like we have to pop, we have to pop open and, and, and release in a sense so that we can get to whatever that next level is. I know that was a good analogy. <laughs> I see it as a treasure chest, but of course, all treasure chests have different aspects to them. It's from ancient Greece. And I think we all know what box this woman is about to open. Pandora's box, fears, anxiety, disease, pestilence, poverty, death, evil or sin, and hope. You know, um, yeah, I mean, this this is this looks like it could be the um, the headlines for 2020. You know, this is what we're all dealing with um, with this year. Um, a literal Pandora's box has been opened up, and um, we're having to deal with it. And we're having to find ways to not allow it to overwhelm us. Um, it, it's about a loss of innocence, right? It's about realizing that um, that life is um, there's something more that's happening, like Persephone going along and 
picking her flowers, you know, innocently in beautiful spring. And the next moment she knows she's been grabbed by the king of hell and is taking him down, taking her down, king of the underworld, I should say. I wouldn't, shouldn't want, don't want to call him hell, king of the underworld. And, um, and that's an incredible loss of innocence. So hope kind of kind of is important there, but also as music, art, and the ways we deal with things. I should I meant to do this. I meant to move this up to the earlier part of the talk because I thought it would be a great way to put it. But um, <laughs> this is the twelfth house. <laughs> I know I do, but when this movie came out in 1977, it scared the heck out of me. Every time I've gotten the water sense, like I just I'm always worried this is being underneath it and. And hello, if this isn't the 12th, if this isn't 2020, I don't know what is. Um, we, um, for those of us here in the United States, um, and I, I mean, what's going on here isn't really any different than what's going on in the rest of the world. We just um, have so many screaming louder at this point. Um, this, um, this year isn't over yet. And there's a lot, there's more surrender. I mean, we're, we're, we've got another few years of some, some real transitions coming on. I think with the, Jupiter and uh, Jupiter Saturn conjunction and um, in Aquarius, I'm I'm having some hopeful thoughts for that in December. And it's really important, you know. It's funny, like when we think about Neptune or Poseidon, um, you know, his original ideas back in the day, he wasn't he wasn't nice. None of those Greek gods were really nice. They were very vengeful. They went after and they did things. So, um, you know, nowadays we have this kind of image of Neptune as being, you know, the great transcendence and the great idealism and the confusion and the fog. But, you know, Poseidon still, he still exacts, he, he exacts a charge. Um, you, you, you're not going to be able to travel through his realm without having to pay a cost. So I like to say people with the 12th house are deep divers or liminal walkers, which um, is relating to a transitional or initial stage of process. I mean, there's this ability to, to understand, you know, how things need to start or how things, you know, need to transition between usually uncomfortable positions. And it's usually occupying a position at both sides of a boundary or a threshold. Um, midwives, hospice workers, astrologers, therapists, certain types of doctors, mediums, sensitives. Um, I think of also, um, I think it was the Colossus at Rhodes, wasn't it? Um, what was it, the statue of Apollo where it was like he was at one foot on one side and then one foot on the other. That's like a liminal walker, you know, something that's in both worlds. So it's like this ability to understand and bring both sides. Um, because that's what we need, right? Um, we need to bring these things to consciousness. We need to integrate them. It's not about keeping these things hidden and keeping them under. And so if you don't have any planets in the 12th house, is that, what does that mean? Well, it's really important to realize that, you know, that every month the moon's going to visit the 12th house for about two and a half days. Well, it depends on what signs you use, what sign you use. And so what should you do when the moon visits your 12th house? If you're, if you're a fire sign for your 12th house, meaning that you have Aries, Leo, Sagittarius, um, you know, consider candle meditation where you burn a candle and you look into it and, and see what pops up for you or fire watching, um, fire walking or sunbathing, literally just allowing the sun to bathe you in its light. It's kind of hard to do at night, but when the moon's traveling through during the daytime, it's okay. <laughs> if you have an earth sign, uh, Taurus and Capricorn and Oh my God, I hate when I'm this Sunday. Virgo. <laughs> um, consider getting a hot stone massage, especially Virgo. Um, well, I see any of the earth signs. I mean, you're going so much typically, and it's it's good to be felt. It's good to move. It's good to, to have this body, you know, manipulated. Um, consider doing a labyrinth or a med meditative walk. Um, you know, walking um, like the labyrinth of chart, of course, is really great. Something that brings you in, something that slows down, especially like a Virgo sand tracing, Tai Chi, any kind of a grounding exercise. Um, talk about that later. Air signs, Tai Chi, breathing meditation. Actually, all the signs can use good breathing meditation, bringing the air deep into the belly and breathing and expanding. But especially the air signs, because um, they're usually so busy talking that they're not much breath. Um, as the Chinese say, the hao li, you know, those without breath, you know, hao is breath or ha is breath in, 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 um, in the Hawaiian culture. And so um, they call the white people, those without breath, the hao li. <laughs> 
So it's really good to bring breath in. It's good to allow yourself to be present with that. Singing, of course, and chanting. And finally, water. I mean, Scorpio moon here. Um, I think especially with Scorpio, um, hot water is really good. Um, don't really want to be in any cold water. We're kind of cold watery ourselves. Um, so soaking a long bath, steam, a water meditation, sitting in an ocean, a river, a lake, walking along those, any sort of things that, you know, kind of encourage that. If you have planets in those, in, in the 12th house, this is even more strongly indicated. Um, if any of you have experiences of what you want to share with that, that's great too. I'm happy to hear them. What will help with the 12th house transits and progressions? I like this um, quote from Marianne Williamson, until your knees finally hit the floor, you're just playing at life. And on some level, you're scared because you know you're just playing. The moment of surrender is not when life is over, it's when it begins. Another quote, love is equally as powerful. Just surrender yourself to it. Its beauty can bring you to your knees and tears to your eyes just as easily. Surrender, let yourself go, and you'll feel it. Downward facing dog. Having your head below your heart is really a good thing. Get yourself out of your head. Your head is not going to win. <laughs> your head is not going to win. <laughs> Let go of that control. <laughs> so it's the end of the talk. Just want to let you know I'm doing a really great uh, weekly show with Marilyn LeBlanc on YouTube called Deep Dives with New Perspectives. We're both Aquarians with Scorpio Moons. We did a Ruth Bader Ginsburg talk the other day. Um, also, like I said, talked. Um, I've done a book on um, Astrological Mavericks. It's a wonderful book for research if you're wanting to understand the nuanced ways in which the planets express themselves along each of the signs through all four angles. So it's 48 representations, explanations of each of the planets through each of the signs. And I'm now open for any questions that anyone has. I see a couple of little chat questions going on. Yes, I've got a question. Um, yes, ma'am. What's the difference between a personal expression of the 12th house and the collective? Mm. Oh, that's really, really lovely. Um, can I share something that's a sharing of the two? Yes. Because this is, this is a very interesting when you think when you think about it. Um, so what's been going on a lot in our in especially here in the United States, but we've also seen instances of it in in, in Norway and a couple of other places. But individuals who are um, incredibly sensitive and who maybe don't have the same sort of mental structuring that is been supported in culture, meaning, you know, they have, people would call it behavioral health issues, um, can pick up on energies very easily from the collective and act out on them. And I think when we see these things like where, you know, when the kids started doing, you know, the mass shootings at the schools and things, they're, they're operating at once as an aspect of themselves speaking from their own pain, but I also think they're actually acting from as a, an agent for the collective. Thanks, and Mark. in the sense that's where I think the 12th house, you know, and that, you know, and where I think we can become projected. It's like that place where we can, where we think we're being so careful and it's really only about us. And we think that our, I mean, this is like when I talked about, you know, when you say one thing and you mean your mother, it's like our, our slip shows. It's like, you know, you, you think you've gone in and you've done something very secretly, but it's, it's really not like everyone knows you've done it, but, or it might be the individual who does something for the collective, you know, on a more, more conscious level. Um, God, it was, oh, that movie. I don't know if you've been seeing, there's a series they have on one of the shows is called Evil. And one of the things was like, they, this couple realized that their child was not right, like in an evil, evil way. And they, um, and they, the only, the way I would say it would say self-corrected and that's not coming from, it's not a judgment or criticism. It's not really a compassionate statement, but they knew that that they had to do something to help prevent that from being something that would harm more people. I mean, I don't, I, and maybe that's my Scorpio side that comes up with those sort of examples. <laughs> um, yeah, Wendy, Wendy, I've just got one more thing to say. Um, you said that 2020 is a 12th house year. 
Uh, what's the purpose of the 12th house events in the collective in such a year? I think one of the big things is I think our lives have gotten so big and so outwardly focused that we've lost contact with ourselves. We've lost contact with what it is and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, everyone is so busy working, trying to make the money to, um, to afford to live that, um, that it's not, that there isn't the time and space for us to become the more sensitive beings that are going on. I mean, I, I think what's going on, especially here in, in, in America in the political field, but again, I'm seeing it, you know, in a lot of other countries, you know, it's, it's being, it, you know, people aren't happy. There's a collective unrest. There's, um, there's a, a tipping point of, um, of, of, the cost of that polarity, you know, when we think of busy, busy be Virgo opposite that, you know, if we think of that sixth house as being like our daily work, I think people are really fed up with the idea that there has to be daily work. I think people are really fed up that, that there is inequality. Um, we're moving into an age of more automation. So how do we, how are we going to handle taking care of people um, and have our world be automated and have, you know, you know, um, people living longer and, and uh, people having more children and doing things. I mean, it's like, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we manage all of these things in, in, a, in a collective way? And I think um, most people have just been forced, you know, back into their homes um, where, you know, they maybe have that image that they've created and they've got the, they've got the, the spouse and they've got the 2.5 kids and they've got the two and a half car garage and the seven bedroom house and all those sorts of things. But there's that emptiness inside of them because um, they're so spread thin. And I think um, people are coming home to, people have been coming home, being in their homes, in those relationships that they haven't had to be in. And it's showing them that maybe those things that they thought they really wanted in life aren't really what they want. And so I think there's, it's almost like, a, I, I think a mass um, recompassing, like the, everyone's individual compass is being completely reshifted into um, something that's giving them meaning. I mean, if, if um, when you talk about like, you know, what is the purpose of it? I think, you know, gaining meaning. I think people are tired of the emptiness that, that life is presenting them um, and they're wanting to find, you know, the real why. Of what's going on and that's that that's how i see it but i'm a bit of an idealist <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. thank you very much a meaningful shift thank you so much and wendy go ahead thank you michael um i appreciated your talk and um you know i have gemini in the 12th that mm -hmm. opens with taurus um but i have a north node vesta lilith jupiter conjunct on the ascendant, the north node, Jupiter's on the ascendant. And, um, you know, all that Gemini. <laughs> so like when you had that picture of the cosmos and all the books, the bookcases, I was like, oh yeah, man, I can totally, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. let me just reach into the cosmos and pull that piece of knowledge down. Like it's just like right there, you know? But I have, um, you know, Pisces at the mid heaven and I have Saturn Chiron and Pisces. And then I have Neptune trining. Neptune squaring my sun. So I have a lot of Pisces influence, but my, my thinking was that in EA, we look at the house first, mm -hmm. right? So I, I always see my Gemini deposited in the 12th, you know, not like, I don't always just look at the planet. I mean, I, I see it there, but I don't know. And I, I was just also the fog thing and all that for me, it's, I mean, I get when I was younger and, uh, you know, all that Pisces at the top was like really hard. It was like, holy crap, what, what am I going to do with this? Like, how do I get there? I'm like, you know, it was really, actually really hard. Um, but for me, to me, it's more mystic. It's like, it's like opening the veil to like Avalon. It's not like, uh, it's not a scary fog. It could right. be. But it, I mean, if I didn't do the inner work and find my core, um, I wouldn't be here. I mean, that's, I don't even think I would have made it to 30 actually, but 
all of that, of course, helped me peel away the untruths. Mm. Um, then you have to deal with spiritualized ego and all that stuff. I mean, I, I get that's all part of the path, right? Yeah. Um, for a spiritual soul. Um, I don't know. I was just I could talk about the 12th house forever, but. You know, it's just so beautiful. I mean, yeah, I mean, for you, I mean, there's, I mean, you, yeah, I would, I would imagine that if you don't have, if you haven't, if you aren't already doing that, I would think that you would actually really be good at accessing information like that. I mean, there's some really great people who help facilitate people with that, but I mean, you have a, you have an inherent clarity well, with it. I, I mean, I, when I'm really, really aligned, I'm a medium. I mean, it's, yeah, of course you are. Yeah. I'm an animal communicator. I can talk to an animal you know, in Portugal or 5,000 miles away or whatever. Right. Um, and people come through too, if I really, really am full on, like, you know, don't have to deal with most of the rest of the drama of the world, <laughs> you know, I can just be Neptune. Um, so I've been there at different times in my life, like fully owning it, but. Um, yeah, and that Mercury retrograde and the Neptune and Scorpio and. Yeah. And that. And then, yeah, I mean, and then of course, I mean, look at that, you know, it's basically, you know, that the in conjunct between um, the moon and, and Mercury, you know, like, you know, it's how perfect for you to do the core work, you know, don't, don't speak about your feelings. Uh, well, you know, look at that Saturn, Venus, Pluto, Uranus. I mean, that was bound it's a gift, to be right? a body worker, you know, that's what I, when Saturn was, I was having my Saturn return, I graduated from massage school, you know, it's like perfect. Yeah. Yeah, you and I must be pretty. Oh no, Last actually, 1965. No. 60, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're pretty close. I'm January. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, with that, I mean, and that, you know, that Uranus, Pluto, Chiron, Saturn. I mean, and then you've got Venus in there. That's that. That really helps. I mean, it's you know, yeah, you're. Well, I was bound to do it. Now my yeah, focus but... is, you know teaching writing getting my stuff myself out there on youtube i'm kind of late to the game but it's okay you know pisces water whatever <laughs> just take you know, it I, I like how you said you you were bound to do it and i love i love the double entendre of that because that, yeah that's i mean saturn and pisces and and all the virgo stuff and <laughs> yeah <laughs> wonderful yeah what a beautiful chart thanks for sharing it thank you thanks linda Okay, any uh, final questions? Okay, Michael, you must be exhausted. So thank you so much. It's been so interesting. Would everyone- Bless you, thank you. And if you want, I'm happy to do more um, 12th house stuff on the next talk in November, or we can come up with something else. So we'll figure out something. Oh, they're all so interesting. So thank you so much from all of us. Please thank Michael Bartlett, everyone. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Excellent as always. Bless you, Carolyn.